Good morning. I call to order the Lake Havasu City Council budget work session on Thursday, May 16th, 2019 at 9 a.m. Um, it's actually uh, 9, 13 a.m. Uh, and we got started just a little bit late this morning because out front at Hart Park, uh, we are, uh, we just proclaimed it um, the rock. Random Acts of Kindness Day, uh, Starline Elementary students had uh, walked from Starline Elementary School down to the City Hall Complex uh, to, uh, as part of Rachel's challenge that the city adopted and the Lake Havasu Unified School District adopted it in August. So um, we apologize for, for being tardy, but we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, the, the next item on our agenda would be the Pledge of Allegiance. So if you would please uh, join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If the city clerk would like to uh, call the roll, Ms. Williams. Council members Cal Sheehy. Here. David Lane. Here. Jenny Koch. Here. Gordon Grove. Here. Michelle Lynn. Here. Donna McCoy. Here. Jim Dolan. Here. We now will have our uh, call to the public, our first call to the public. This is uh, where we citizens have an opportunity to address the city council on matters within the jurisdiction of the city. You'd have three minutes uh, um, to uh, address the, the council. Uh, there's uh, not a podium, but there's still a microphone over here. So if you just want to make your way over to the, to the dais if you're interested. Um, with that being said, if anyone's interested, just make your way up. Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Number five is uh, our public hearing presentation, discussion, and potential direction to staff of the budget for fiscal year 2018-19, year-end estimates, fiscal year 2019-20 annual budget, and the five-year capital improvement plan. Do, uh, Mr. Knudsen, do you want to get us started? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Mayor and Council. So today is our first work session dealing with the ongoing budget. We had a work session a few weeks ago that talked about the uh, CIP or the uh, capital improvement pl um, plan. And um, so today we're gonna get into uh, the, the budget that impacts the ongoing day-to-day -day functions uh, of, uh, of the city. Um, this will be our, um, this is the presentation for the uh, uh, draft budget that's coming up. Council will adopt the tenant budget on June 11th and adopt the final budget on June 25th. This is the uh, work session we have for the budget. Unless council wants additional time or additional meetings, we can, uh, we can arrange that. But for now, this is uh, the uh, last work session before we get into those, uh, those uh, discussions on June 11th and June 25th. Um, sometimes we get lost in the minutia of the budget and forget to take a step back and explain the process to our residents. So uh, um, I'd like to take a, a moment to play a real short video, a two, three minute video um, that does a re really good job of explaining the budget process from a, a big picture perspective. So. I can do this. Hey, Dad, how come the pool wasn't open today? Well, son, a city or town has a budget it has to follow. Sometimes a pool has to be closed because they need to save money to spend somewhere else, such as for a park, or to keep our community safe with more police and firefighters. I don't understand. What's a city budget? Well, imagine the city is like a pizza. A pizza? Yeah, everyone has their favorite kind. You like pepperoni, but mom likes mushrooms, and your brothers like sausage, right? Yeah. Well, imagine you were building a pizza that an entire city or town could enjoy. That's a lot of cheese. It sure is. Now, imagine how much this pizza would cost. When managing a city or town budget, some residents think that maintaining our streets is the most important ingredient. Other people might want a pool open every day. That is why we as residents have a voice in deciding the most essential ingredients to make a great city or town. But what happens when people want more ingredients, like new parks, extended library hours, or other public resources? Every year, by mid-July, each Arizona city and town is required to adopt a balanced budget that reflects their unique community needs. Each resident can have a voice in deciding how the budget will be spent before it's adopted. Just like ordering a pizza, this process depends on input as to what will be on the pizza, its size, and how much we are willing to pay for it. Oh, I see. It's our city or town, and our input matters. 
To find out more about how and when you can participate in the development of your city or town budget process, visit azcitieswork.com. Thank you for the opportunity to play the little video. I think it does a good job of a real quick snapshot. Um, today, throughout the uh, presentation, you'll see a few pictures, and uh, just remind, uh, they're, they're, they're there to remind us all that these budgets that we discuss uh, impact uh, our residents, our employees, and the services that we provide to the community. Um, here in this picture, you'll see our employees in the Administrative Services Department beaming with pride after receiving the Excellence in Financial Reporting Award for our CAFR, which is our public document uh, to our residents, our comprehensive annual financial report. In a moment, I'll turn the uh, presentation over to uh, Jill and her team, and she's going to lead the discussion on the expenditure overview, department budgets, and next steps. But first, let's briefly reflect on a few of the city's accomplishments in the last uh, budget year. But first, here's a picture of our, a few of our dedicated employees. I'm not sure who the uh, dork in the back is jumping. Um, oh, that's me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> here's a, a very small sample of our accomplishments in the uh, current fiscal year. As you can see, the city is working hard to uh, improve our community. Um, we uh, passed uh, Prop 409 uh, just a few months ago, and back in uh, back in August. And we've had a lot of questions about Prop 409 since that time, and there's been some confusion on what Prop 409 did or did not do for the city. Prop 409 did not give the city any additional funds. It uh, simply removed the restriction or the cap that limited our ability to spend the money as a city that we uh, already collect. Uh, we're still bound by the resources the city collects, which means that we can't spend more than, than uh, that we, we bring in. Um, essentially, if Prop 49 would have failed, there would have been uh, significant cuts in services and a large reduction in our workforce. Um, probably, uh, probably a conservative a number is, is uh, a, a more than 100 employees would have been laid off with the city. That's uh, essentially what Prop 49 uh, meant for me as a manager. Um, so with the passage of Prop 409, it uh, allows the city to continue to provide the same level of service that our residents already expect and that we're already providing to the community. And the uh, 76 approval rating from the voters showed us that the residents trust the city to do the right thing. Some other accomplishments uh, on the list here. Uh, you'll see that uh, we uh, lease property on, on uh, Kiowa to the Havasi Community Health Foundation, and they're using that uh, for a food bank. We had an interagency that, uh, that failed, uh, went under uh, last year, and... Uh, um, we did our part, a little bit of a part, to help support other agencies in the community to continue to provide services that are that are needed. Um, we brought back uh, Teen Break. That's something that's uh, that's uh, um, our residents uh, um, really appreciated, and we had a lot of positive uh, feedback from bringing that back to a, a, a bigger event than we had in the previous year. Um, other things, we have a, a new easier to use use website, and we're working hard uh, as the uh, uh, as we all see with the uh, different infrastructure improvements that are taking place throughout the community. Um, we have uh, all the, the restrooms at uh, Rotary Park and Lennon Bridge Beach are being improved so that we can now handle larger crowds. And uh, our uh, road improvements on Lake Havasu Avenue and the, uh, the road leading into the uh, future Havasu, Havasu uh, Riviera project are all accomplishments for this existing fiscal year. So uh, from here, I'll, uh, we can slide on over to uh, Jill Olson and her team to take the lead on the rest of the presentation. We will be reviewing the expenditure budgets um, overall for all of the departments in the city. We're going to cover the, cover the expenditures um, in main categories. So we'll start with the category of personnel so that you, when you look in your budget books and the material that you have, if, when you see some major differences or you know, significant differences in a department's budget from year to year, overall, these are some of the expenditures that affected each of those departments. So to start, we look at personnel. Um, in order to accommodate uh, potential step increases and merit increases, um, we, are, we included a 3.4% increase in personnel over the prior year's budget. Um, we also had an increase in health care. Um, the rates are shown as an increasing by about 7.6%, which equates to about $600,000 overall. In the pension area, the Arizona State Retirement System rates were increasing, and also public safety, um, public retirement system shows a decrease for this year. That is due to the prepayments for funding two years of PSPRS. 
And so we're anticipating that next year there very well could be an increase in that category and not a continued decrease. The new full-time budgeted positions that are in this draft budget for your review, um, we have several changes, um, most of which are not increases in total FTEs, but they are increases in the number of those that are budgeted. Um, the events coordinator position would be replaced with an assistant to the city manager position, and those responsibilities would include events coordination, um, intergovernmental issues, and public information officer duties. We're also proposing to bring the janitorial services in-house, so we will take the dollars that were previously spent on the contracts for janitorial and apply those toward um, in-house services, at resulting in the positions you see listed there. And that includes um, taking care of the restrooms in the parks. In the services area, um, we had an approximate 7.1% increase or $1.1 million over the prior year budget. There's a list um, following of some of the main items that were included that contribute to that increase. We've got the you know, studies, the position analysis, and the water and rate wastewater study, and then the, some of the other items that are listed there. Um, and in addition, a couple items that weren't listed but that are also very important, the census has been included, funding has been included there, and also funding for a citizen survey has been included in the, in the proposed budget. In the supplies area, about 11.4% increase over prior budget. Um, that includes the items you see listed there, kind of as a highlight. It, it's a partial list of additions, not comprehensive. Um, fire department supplies, um, hose replacements and turnout replacements. Um, fuel increase for the police department in, in addition to public safety supplies there. Um, um, wastewater chemicals, um, maintenance service supplies, um, and a slight decrease in IT supplies and equipment. May I ask a question? Of course. I don't mean to interrupt you, uh, ma'am. First of all, I just I want to say, uh, what are the ground rules? Like, can we ask a question while you're talking? Certainly. So, okay, cool. Um, the remember we carried. Uh, we were going to get an above ground uh, fuel tank storage for uh, for yes. for the police. Is that? Included in here, that was that's a project that's included in the CIP. Oh right, yeah, okay, but that's why I was it's wondering. Pushed out of you. I don't think it's in the current year. The Thanks. Proposed. Mm -hmm. In the category of other expenditures, um, there's approximate eleven point seven percent increase, or one point three million dollars, um, with the increase in the revenues, um, tourism revenue, and, and development agreements. Costs go up since those are passed through to, to those three listed there. Um, the county jail costs are showing an increase in the budget. This is to reflect the amount that's actually already being spent. So we were under budgeted for fiscal year 1819, and so we're making that correction to more closely match what's actually being spent for the jail costs. Then we're showing um, a potential contract decrease of at least 50,000 in the animal control contract with the Humane Society. Um, and then we have our grants and trash service cost increase. And those that are marked with an asterisk have offsetting revenues. So the cost increased, but the revenue did also. Can I ask another question, for Mr. Mayor? Um, you know, the trash service cost increase of 325,000. I know we've, uh, we've recently, well, I don't know how recently, we went to the big new trash bins and one was for recycle, one's for trash. And now the bottom has fallen out of the recycle industry because China doesn't take those goods anymore. Other communities are making changes with their, uh, obviously their their agreements. Can I get an update of what that looks like for us? Because I still got the two bins, and if, if I can't use the recycle bin, I'd use that for trash when I want to cut my palm fronds. You know, I mean, like I don't know what are we going to do there? Can I get a little update? Yeah, uh, um, uh, Mayor Xi, uh, Councilmember Grote, we've had some uh, um, good conversations with uh, Republic Services 
um, with Mr. Uh, Mr. Matt Cross in the last couple of weeks. And uh, yeah, that you're absolutely right. Uh, nationwide, you're looking at cities as big as Pittsburgh that are are, are going to be uh, re removing their uh, their recycling services from their community. Uh, as close as Bullhead City, they're looking at uh, a change in their contract where if you want recycling to service at your home, it's going to cost you, potentially, they still have to go through the process, but the, the, what they're looking at right now, it's going to cost that resident an extra $10. So as a resident, you have to pay $10 a month to uh, have a recycling container at your, at, your, uh, at your residence. We're not looking at that situation at Havasu. Our residents are doing a really good job with the, re the recycling. The program has, has worked uh, very, very well. Um, but you're right, the, uh, the, as far as the, uh, the uh, China and, and other foreign countries purchasing or recycling goods, uh, glass market has bottomed out, plastics have bottomed out. The, uh, the one market that remains strong is uh, cardboard. So I, I, uh, with all the different uh, uh, internet shopping that's, uh, that's being done and, and have a student across the country, there's lots of cardboard that uh, comes with uh, those services and, and uh, you know, they need those materials to package up more goods that are delivered to the homes. Overall, we're in good shape. Um, but we're seeing a national trend and we're looking at very closely at this to make sure that we're not going to fall into the, the same type of scenario that, uh, that we see in uh, big cities or even in Bullhead City. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. It's a great answer. Um, you know, the glass and the plastics, I assume what's going to wind up is <laughs> residents going to want to put that in the trash and it's going to go to our landfill. So our landfill, um, the status of that's going to fill up faster. Also on this page, PED and CVB. Um, Budgets, I was doing some quick numbers based on sales tax. Well, the, in particular, the hotel room tax and uh, and the bar tax and what that means. And uh, it looks like their budget grew about $177,000 this year, more or less, ballpark. And um, is that, uh, as, as the uh, taxes, revenues continue to go, um, that'll just continue to grow, right? That doesn't actually change their budgets. I didn't see that line item in here for what that dollar was, so I, I calculated it out. Do you have any overview on that, Mr. City Manager? Yeah, if, if I may, Mr. Uh, City Manager, Mr. Go members of the council, uh, just to, for proper flow of information, I prefer that uh, Jill goes through the presentation, jot down all any notes you have on any particular items, and then we'll go through one at one. I, I don't want to keep uh, getting sidetracked on what the overall picture of this is going to be. Um, so those numbers are in here. Um, we'll, we'll identify the CVB and PED contribution uh, when, when we get there. But just jot down notes, and, and all the city staff is prepared to, to, um, to answer questions at this time. I'm not prepared to allow that to happen. So, so just go ahead. Let's go through the presentation. We're, we'll take notes, and then we'll, we'll hit every item. So I, every item every member of the council has absolutely will be addressed. Oh. But, but I want to make sure that we can flow through the information so we can comprehend all of what's okay, happening. I'll totally respect that, Ms. Okay. Mayor. Thank That's you. why I kind of asked what the ground rules were because yep. I didn't want to go do this. Yeah, no, I appreciate unless it. it was okay for us to do this on yep. a page by page. But no, you know, no, we want to roll it. it all up and do it yeah. again. So That's fine. I'll yep. take notes. Thank you. I appreciate it, uh, Ms. Olson. All right. Thank you. The next category is capital outlay. Capital outlay. You're going to see um, a partial list of items in this presentation. However, in your um, budget books that we prepared. The, there's a full list on pages 31 and 32, I believe. Um, these are one-time items funded with one-time um, revenues. These are not, we try not to use any operating budgets for the capital outlay items. Um, for 1920, we have about a $2.7 million total for capital outlay, um, an increase of about 110,000 over the prior budget. And then there's just a short list of some of the things that are included in the capital outlay total. Um, public safety vehicles, um, parks improvements of 150,000. Um, City Manager Knudsen mentioned the last time that we are going to start adding every other year 150,000 as a goal to, for park improvements um, dedicated to that, that category. Um, and then you can see the additional items there listed with your full list again um, in your budget books. We're going to slide on into public work or to Parks and Rec there with that one to steal that line. Um, finally, um, contingency. The 1920 budget for contingency, we have a total for all funds of approximately $2.2 million. Um, these items are for those things um, that arise, critical items that arise that are unfunded in the budget for the next fiscal year. Um, 
of that 2.2 million, the general fund is $500,000 for contingency. Um, wastewater has $1 million and water or IDD has 500,000 in contingency. And then some smaller amounts in some of the other smaller funds tr for the remaining $200,000. Um, for debt, uh, there is a $10.7 million decrease from the prior budget. Um, decreases due to the passing of the expenditure limitation increase. We did not have to um, budget for any potential debt related to the expenditure limitations, so therefore you see that decrease. Um, we're also making the last public safety personnel retirement system debt payment in August of 2019. So after that, debt will go down significantly over $6 million. And there is no new debt proposed um, in the FY1920 budget that's being presented to you. Part of the budget process was to have the departments put together a list of supplemental items that were above their base budget. So whatever they had in their base budget, in their budget last fiscal year, um, less any one-time items, we kind of held that as their new base for the 1920 budget, and then they made requests for supplemental items. We had an, over 500 supplemental items requested by the departments. Um, currently, we've approved uh, the city manager has approved for and recommending for your approval about $4.8 million that have, um, in additional expenditures for the budgets. Um, these items were based upon the current funding that's available and those items were prioritized by the departments. So we did take a look at the approval or denial of those items based upon the existing um, current funding. For the department budgets, in this presentation, we have a just a summary to show what the total department budget is for the various <coughs> departments. Um, any CIP amounts specific to that department or fund are included in, in these numbers. This shows 1920. You will have a comparison column in your budget books so that you can take a look at maybe even more detailed line items in addition to um, trends related to the prior year budget. The, there's an increase showing in Parks and Rec and a decrease in Public Works maintenance due to the shifting of Parks maintenance from Public Works over to Parks. So that's one of the major changes you'll see there. And then there's quite an increase in the airport fund due to grant funded projects for the next fiscal year. And those are just the remainder of the departments and funds. This is just a summary chart so that you can see on a percentage basis um, how much of the budget is made up by the different departments and functions. So utilities represent um, the enterprise funds, the wastewater and water primarily. Um, the remainder of the departments are primarily paid for with general funds. All right, the next steps um, will be, as city manager in indicated earlier, Tuesday, June 11th, um, we'll, be, we'll be bringing the tentative budget to council to be adopted in addition to the five-year CIP, or capital improvement plan. Then on June 25th, we'll have the truth and taxation hearing um, and the final budget adoption. And then on July 9th, we will be bringing the property tax levies to council for your adoption of those. And with that, we'll be happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Do any members uh, of the council have questions for Ms. Olson and her team? Uh, Ms. Olson, can we talk a little bit about the uh, um, the contingency funds and the budget stabilization reserve? This uh, we talked about uh, um, about three months, I believe, of, of, of reserves and just kind of talk through that process uh, for the public and for the benefit of the council, please? Yes. We had talked about um, about three months. We're going to, for the general fund, due to the volatility of our main revenue items, we have included um, budget stabilization reserves of about 25% of the average of the five previous years of revenues. So for FY 1920, that's about $12 million, just a little over $12 million. We also included 15% um, um, in the IDD fund and the wastewater fund. So for the IDD, that's 
just a little under $3 million. And for the wastewater fund, that is just under $4 million that have been set aside in contingency for those things that, that come up that we hadn't planned. Excellent. Thank you. And then uh, could we spend a, a few minutes on, on the rate? I, I know we're proposed, this budget that um, is presented to us is proposing to keep the rate flat. Um, and just talk a little bit about that, if you, if you will. Yes, we are proposing that the property tax rate remain flat. Um, with that, we would generate an additional little about $230,000 just by leaving the rate flat. And then new construction we've estimated will be about an additional almost $71,000. So altogether about $300,000 additional with the property tax rate staying the same. Thank you. And that's uh, obviously the, the rate stays the same. Uh, the revenues is increasing because of the assessed values of, of homes and the, and the value of the homes. So, um, Correct. And, and there, there is a history of the uh, rates that have been set uh, in the budget book for, for the council's review, if anyone has any comments or questions on that. And then uh, may, maybe, uh, uh, Mr. Coonson, if you want to talk a little bit about the uh, supplemental uh, budget requests and kind of how you went through that process and um, you, you approved a whole lot less than you uh, than were submitted, so maybe just talk that through a little bit. Yeah, it was a, an uh, exercise and, and uh, um, working with the uh, uh, department heads, I, uh, I asked them as we sit down as, as a team and have these discussions and, uh, and uh, you know, I, I want the, uh, the needs, not the wants, but uh, coming to the table with a list of, of uh, needs in, in, within your department so we can identify what uh, what's happening. So it allows us as a team to not ignore issues that are out there that are pending, um, but uh, let's look at where we need to be. Obviously, we can't approve every request that comes in from the different departments, but uh, at least now we have a better understanding as a, as a team of where we need to be, either short term or long term, and uh, be, be able to uh, kind of you know assess where, where we're at and where, where we need to go. So that was that was part of that exercise. A little over. So $12.8 million, I think we got in, in requests, uh, excluded any type of grants, um, 500 individual requests um, from all through the different departments. And I can assure you 99.9% .9 of those requests were, uh, were, were needs that identified uh, um, something that the, uh, the city should be uh, looking at uh, very, very closely over the course of the next few years. So that was the process and we wanted to kind of identify that, um, to kind of paint that picture for council. Belts are very tight within the, within the city. We're we're lean and mean, and we're providing good services uh, uh, to the community. But there's uh, certain times where uh, where relief is needed within uh, um, certain departments. Um, look at uh, police for for an example. It's been um, three years since uh, police vehicles were uh, were purchased, so we're able to provide some relief with some uh, replacement vehicles in uh, the police department. Um, we're able to do some things in in, uh, in fire with uh, looking at uh, turnout gear, fire hose. Um, some replacement vehicles in, in uh, that department. Those are certain. Uh, those are obviously needs within the community uh, to uh, to uh, protect the uh, protect our, uh, our uh, protect our uh, our properties and, and our, our families. So those are some examples there that uh, identified. Uh, it was a lot of work to go through and identify those certain things, but um, um, now we have a better idea of kind of where, where we're at and be able to better assess our existing situation and where we might want to be moving forward. So does that help? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the deferred, then you guys working towards um, having those go into future budget discussions in subsequent years. Given our resources, okay. uh, we uh, we have more needs than we have dollars, so we have to make hard decisions uh, about where we spend our dollars. You know, kind of going back to that uh, pizza in the in yes. the, uh, the short video there. And then uh, another question for you is uh, maybe just uh, highlight a little bit about the uh, community survey that uh, was mentioned um, in the report. Uh, so we identify a, a request for $16,000 for a community survey. Is that the item? Yes. Uh, Mayor, thank you. Um, we have uh, um, we haven't done a community-wide survey in, um, in recent history anyway. And so what that would do is allow us to uh, um, do a survey our, our residents or, or a sample size of our residents that would give us some good, pretty good data and uh, ask them certain questions about uh, the community and the city services and maybe, uh, maybe a couple questions in there about uh, some um, future projects or, or um, considerations that council might have uh, kind of moving forward. So um, a lot of times we, we do a really good job of getting out in the community and having discussions and people that show up to the different uh, council meetings, but 
Um, we have a lot of uh, hardworking families that don't have time to engage with council or staff on a regular basis. So it's just another avenue for us to collect information from our residents and help guide that, uh, guide that process and, uh, as far as the services we provide and how we provide it to the community. So, okay. Thank you. Do any members of the council have any specific questions for anyone? Uh, Councilmember Lynn? Um, I just have a quick question. Um, on the city manager, it says we're adding an assistant to the city manager position. We've never had that, obviously. We've never had that position. And you're looking at page 37 for 37, 37 if uh, the, the council uh, fell along. In, uh, in recent times, we uh, the city had a uh, either a deputy city manager or an assistant city manager position in the past. It's been a, uh, in a PIO. It's been it's been a couple of years. Uh, it's very typical um, for cities, um, certainly cities uh, the size of like Havasu, to have a, either an assistant uh, city manager or an assistant to um, allows um, frees up, frankly, some of my time to to focus on uh, bigger picture items. Um, so right now we have a special events coordinator position that's vacant in parks after Mr. Allen um, moved moved, uh, moved on to the uh, the Midwest, and so we were looking at uh, that position. Is that a position that uh, demands 40 hours uh, uh, a week, or, or is that a position that we could look at in a different way that and pile on a few more responsibilities for that? So that that was the uh, that's the intention there. Okay. Are there any other questions, Vice Mayor Lane? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a couple questions. Um, this probably goes to Mr. Knudsen. Uh, I noticed there's a thing in here um, on this, I believe it was $60,000 for the school district tennis courts. Um, could you explain uh, why we're spending $60,000 for the school district? So the uh, city entered into an IGA with the Lake Havasu uh, Unified School District a few years back. That's a, I believe it was a 10-year agreement, so we have a few years uh, of, uh, of that. And uh, we're looking at uh, the language in there basically says, uh, says that every five years that uh, the, uh, the city has to make improvements to the tennis courts that are located on the school district property. The 60000 that uh, you see in, in the budget will recoup 30000 back from the, uh, for the school district. Uh, for a total of sixty thousand dollars worth of improvements uh, for the tennis courts on the school district's property, uh, I assume the intention at the time that uh, that agreement was executed was then if the city con uh, contributes towards that facility, then it uh, then becomes open to the public. So, but that's uh, we're obligated by contract is the short answer. Right, and I just want to make sure um, if you know, are those tennis courts open to the public to use? I know some things. Uh, in the school districts or not. So. Yes, those uh, tennis courts are open to the public. There is a, uh, a tennis club um, that, uh, that's in the community that uses that, uh, that facility pretty regularly. So it's a less expensive way for us to have tennis courts for our public without having to actually build tennis courts. Mm -hmm. yeah. Perfect, thank you. Um, and then uh, I also noticed there was an item in there for a booster pump station at Cypress Park, um, which is our brand new park. Mm -hmm. Did we not uh, have the booster pump uh, that we needed at the time, or what was the, the issue with that? I'm going to defer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Uh, Mr. Mark Clark will, uh, will fill us in. What that booster pump is, it's actually just a pony pump to increase the pressure there at the, the, the park. Uh, the pressures are working now, but what we had anticipated was having effluent there fairly quickly, so that would have given us a higher pressure, but in the, in the meantime, uh, this expenditure will give us a much better coverage of the, uh, the sprinkler heads and, and work through that process. So it's just a case of operationally, uh, the, the, the sprinkler heads are working at the pressure that's being provided by the potable water supply, but this will increase that and, and make it a much better facility. Okay, thank you for that. And then um, the, the last thing I just wanted to mention, and I wanted to, to say thank you to uh, all of our city staff and also to the public. Um, the city staff has, has uh, given us a, a budget uh, with no debt, and we're paying off a lot of debt, which is, to me, when you're paying off debt, uh, getting rid of that debt lowers costs that where we're just paying interest rates and all that. And, and thank you to the public for passing Prop 409 so we don't have to issue debt uh, to just continue with the, uh, the services that we have now. So that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Vice Mayor Lane. Do any other members of the council have any questions for, for staff? I just want to make a point of clarification so that people can understand. When we're talking about moving positions around, 
Um, the way we cast positions, we use an acronym called FTE. I'm sure department heads all know that by heart, um, but not necessarily the public at large. Uh, FTE, if you want to give them an idea how we do that and how that's carried so that they know. Sure, FTE, uh, FTE uh, stands for full-time equivalent. It, uh, it's a reflection of the, uh, the amount of full-time employees we have working within the organization or um, by department. So we, as a city, we, uh, we, we employ full-time employees, part-time employees, and seasonal employees. FTE reflects the full-time employees. Okay, and then kind of following up to that, Mr. City Manager, and, and to the Finance Department, it's a question that will drive back to the... Um, price increase in the health care costs, which is pretty modest. Most corporate environments will see costs on an FTE basis or one full-time equivalent basis uh, rise significantly higher in a percentage point than what ours has, and that's because we're self-insured. Um, but what I'm curious about, that's why I'm going to tie the FTE in. Um, you know, when we shift around FTEs in the, um, there's a personnel count in the report. Thank you very much. Very nice. Um, Usually it's pretty obvious. There's one FTE gained here, one FTE lost here, half one or whatever, and until you get to one department where it's like fractional, like they're right into it. You know which one I'm talking about. Um, but what I'm curious about is, you know, we don't give necessarily benefits to every employee in the city. We have seasonal employees. They don't get benefits, right? Um, people who probably work, I don't know what our smallest FTE is, 0.25. Would that be fair? I don't know. Um, what I'm driving at is, is that rate, in in your professional estimation, somewhat blunted by the fact that we've shifted FTEs around and we have fewer people on those services? Or is that, in your opinion, a genuine reflection of what the actual cost increase was in the, in the provision of health care for our people? Mr. Grove, could you clarify a little bit? I, I'm, I'm a little lost at what the question is. So, so that we have a total number of FTEs that are proposed in the budget book. Right. Uh, and then if you shift costs? if you shift people into roles where they're not getting health care then all of a sudden your health care costs get lower sure so now instead of you know going up 15% they're only going up 10% I'm it may that may not be the case it may be the so case that we didn't lose anybody off those roles so your question just did we shift FTEs over to part time to decrease the no, increase uh, well, of health care I, I was just asking if it was a professional opinion whether or not um, the movement of FTEs created an art of a number that it doesn't really reflect yeah, great. what it went up there there was no shift of that kind okay uh, where we have employees losing benefits based upon the changing the category of their position okay and then do you have a, a it's not in here and we normally won't go back but it is helpful just to understand because this is usually one of the larger expense items associated with employee that's not directly a salary component um, in fact, it is the largest. Our ERES are probably somewhere around 40%-ish. So the explanation for that is if you, and I'll just use easy numbers so it's easy to do the mental gymnastics, if you hire somebody for $100,000 a year, that doesn't normally happen, but if you did, you'd really have to spend $140,000 a year to carry that person through the year. So 40% ERES, your benefits, your matching contributions, so on and so forth. Um, in the ERE question, um, are, are we still, or do you, you, do you do a calculation and it gives you roughly the percentage in the change year over year? I don't assume it changed much because our health care didn't change much. That's the largest impact. So that's the first question. Um, I'll, I'll let you answer that one. It's probably an easy answer. Yeah, we have a what we call our payroll library, and so we actually budget down to the individual position level. Yeah. Um, Often, for the majority of the employees, we know what kind of coverage they have, so we know what the particular health care cost is going to be. So, so it's budgeted pretty closely to what it is. Okay, and then my follow-up question, this one might be a little more difficult, but you probably know it off the top of your head because you're intimately involved with this data, is related to not just year over year, it goes up, let's say, 10% or 7%. But if we look back three to five years, what does that trend line look like? For health care? Yeah, yeah, really. I 
Um, I, uh, have the health can, uh, Mayor Sheehy, uh, Council Member Grote, uh, can I ask uh, Ms. Pobicki um, to come up and just talk a little bit about uh, our trust. Um, we, we're we're, we're uh, self-insured through our uh, through our trust. We have a relationship with uh, Bullhead City and Kingman. That'd be great because this is a uh, really important right. subject and for then our maybe, city. I think last year our, we had a very nominal increase with uh, health care costs, um, but uh, maybe uh, we have a better understanding, surely, of, of uh, background and some trends. Okay. Um, as most of you are aware, in 2012, we formed the NABT, which incorporated the city of Bullhead and the city of Kingman and the city and Lake Havasu <coughs> City into one trust uh, to kind of spread the risk and take advantage of economy of scale. So our rate increases over the past five, six years have been pretty flat. And we're able to do that based on our actuarial calculations that use the uh, census from the previous year, uh, directly correlating that with claims. So it's, it's a, I think, a more accurate calculation rather than using a national average or a trend for healthcare costs. So we're, we're using actual figures to look at trends, which is much more realistic in our claims analysis. So the actuary comes back with the projected rates Trustees sit down, we look at uh, different um, changes that may be made, different enhancements to plans. We do have two plans, the EPO and the high deductible health plan, um, and then have open enrollment meetings where we educate employees on the benefits of each plan. They make choices. You may see some shifting in those two plans, which will impact the percentage of change in your benefits. So the 7.6 is kind of an average based on that actuarial assignment. And it's been pretty flat. We've enjoyed a couple of years where we had no rate increases. Woo -hoo. <laughs> I know, it was. We, we've done a really good job. I am, I've been on the uh, board since the inception and I'm quite proud of the accomplishments that the NABT has made. Did that answer your question? That answered my question beautifully. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And I just, you know, hats off to, I don't know who engineered this, but I think some of you old timers like you, Cal, you might have been around. Oh, no. I don't, I don't no. think I was. That, yeah. that well, even I precedes credit, you? But it is, a great, uh, <laughs> it is a great way to spread risk. And, yeah, uh, just to kind of paint a little different view on that so that the public hears this and knows this. If you were running a, well, a company like yours, Cal, for example, or, or uh, any company, um, it's very typical for you to see those increases go up 20 to 25%. If that's the largest component of your ERES, your, in our case, our general fund budget, taking care of our employees' benefits and salaries would skyrocket. So we'd, we'd then have to cut more people out. And that would be horrible. That's not what we want to accomplish. So I just wanted to um, sound a note of appreciation on that. Further, I want to, since I'm here doing the appreciative thing, that's okay. Um, in seven years of doing council work and six years of being on NPR's board and doing, I just have always gone right to the numbers, race to those numbers, look at them, digested them, tried to understand what the year-over-year -year changes were going to be so you can identify where the major changes are taking place in the departments. And it's, it adds hours to your day when you do this. Um, but in this year's presentation, I want to highlight this. I did the same thing. I went to the back and I started looking at all the numbers and invested all my time in that. And then I noticed at the bottom there's a nice little table and that table shows in each one of these areas where the year-over-year -year changes were. The larger ones anyways, the ones of note, which is the information you're trying to call when you're doing the actual crunching of the numbers. Um, that made it very easy. So finally I went to the notes section in the very front, the introduction, where it was all explained so beautifully I could have saved myself about five hours. Um, but anyways, I really wanted to say how appreciative I am because I believe that this budget is extremely transparent. I think it's approachable for anybody, even if you don't do large budgets like this. The easy way to think about this is it's just like your household budget. Take three zeros off the end, and there's a lot more stuff to look at. But at the end of the day, it's really approachable because everything's explained in here because of the tables at the bottom of each departmental breakdown and because of the introduction. So thank you very much for doing that. I think this is the finest budget I've ever seen in municipality, the way it's presented ever. And you know, that's amazing. Um, one of the things I did have a question about, you know, like the, uh, we got some replacement costs coming up. Like when we do five police cars, that's, that's quite a bit. 
Um, I don't ask this question very often, but I just want to, you know, I have some frame of reference in here and I just want to kind of confirm it. Uh, so five vehicles, I think I heard three years old, I don't know how many miles they put them over the course of three years or the, you know, what that status is on those vehicles. And then the other component, which <laughs> kind of like ERE's, it costs a lot of money, is the gear that goes inside the police uh, vehicle. It's, it's very expensive. Does that get reused or do we sell that into a secondary market as a complete package? What's that look like? Uh, I'm just curious. Uh, uh, Mayor Sheehy, Councilmember Groat, I'm going to ask uh, Chief Doyle to, uh, to address this. Mayor, Councilman Groat. Um, actually, the vehicles we're replacing aren't three years old. We, we haven't replaced vehicles in three oh, years. Okay. The vehicles we're replacing are 10 plus years old. Um, so yeah, we're replacing vehicles 2007s, 2008s that are well over 100,000 miles on them. And, and yeah, and then um, what we do is, is um, if they're the model years, we have Crown Victorias still, and Crown Victorias haven't been <laughs> around in quite some time. Um, so it's hard to transfer equipment direct from a Crown Victoria to the new Explorer model, but we do have some older Explorers that will replace. Anything we can transfer, we do transfer. But you're absolutely correct, and the outfitting of the patrol cars is a, a very expensive thing. So we do transfer everything that we can to reduce costs. Chief, I want to thank you for that answer. I promise I won't call you captain. You can call me whatever you'd like. Because <laughs> you're a chief. you got stars here. Um, uh, yeah, I really appreciate that answer because I think some people might misinterpret what? They replace the vehicle after three years? Like, you know, I don't do that. I, I, I don't even have mine paid off after three years. I would love to be able to do that. Even five <laughs> years would be way ahead of the curve for us. So we have vehicles that have over 100,000 miles. Oh, yes. And we expect those to, you know, in the need of an emergency, drive at very high rates of speed down the highway. Well, that's what we hope. Okay. Well, well I think it's a good idea to replace. And thank you for explaining that these are 10 years old with over 100,000 miles, because I think that becomes a risk management issue for the city if we don't replace them. Uh, that's very good. Uh, and then the other one I had to ask, but I, I think I have the answer already, but, you know, um, I don't know how much more we're going to go into some of the other details of the budget. Like, if I don't ask the questions now, am I done? Is that the end of it? Yeah, this will be your opportunity. This so is it. Then it's over. It. Yeah, so let, let's, <laughs> let's be concise and ask the questions, and, uh, and we'll get the answers. Wow. Well, since the police chief is here, you know, I'm going to kind of turn uh, into a different direction and say that um, I'm, I'm curious. Um, I think of how I want to ask this. You know. Uh, we have um, uh, a pretty large budget. Actually, you know, the I don't know if I remember this accurately off the top of my head, but I think our police department costs us about $19.8 a year in this budget. I believe our fire department was about $16.4 million, thereabouts. We're ballpark, you know, it's rough, rough numbers there. So it's almost $20 million. So it constitutes one of the largest items. If you add the two of them together, fire department and police department, our public safety component, this is... This is the big, this is the big pizza, so to speak, since we have the pizza video. That's 25% um, is, is reported by Ms. Olson. Yeah, it's, it's so it's, it's really big. <laughs> and in there, um, we have some questions related to, this is kind of, uh, I'm, I'm getting off track just a little bit, but why not? Because I'm not going to have the opportunity again. No, but we still need to stay on track. So please respect that everyone's well, time. close to track. Okay, I'll respect you. your time. You know, I'm, thank you. I'm, I had to take the day off to get here, so I'm paying out of my own pocket to be here today. So I'll respect your time, I promise. No, all of our time. Everybody's time. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we have in our um, step and pay grades for our police department bands, um, and when we do salary analysis, we choose three positions. We can choose more if we want to, but we choose three. We include a position called police officer senior, that position is included in the salary sort of analysis. And my understanding is that position has been frozen for a number of years. So I don't know who to ask this question to, whether it's a city manager question, whether it's a chief of police question, or whether it's an HR director question. But why would I use a pay band for a salary analysis when somebody can't be put into that band? If it's at the top end of the band, it seems like an artificial compression tool. Could you? Expand on that, please, Chief. 
Yeah, I can give you a little bit of history of actually how the whole thing came to be. Um, the senior police officer position was created back in the 90s, and the criteria was you're a, uh, at three years of service as a police officer, you have an opportunity to test to become a, a senior police officer, and then you could move into that second band of officer. When we hit the uh, um, recession, obviously they froze those positions because you know we were reducing, we were going through a reduction in force, and it was frozen. Uh, when we recovered from the recession, then we hit right into the expenditure limitation. Uh, we didn't have any more money to add to the budget, and so that position has stayed frozen. And where we're at today is I have about nine, nine of my police officers are actually in, uh, and give or take one or two, I, I'm thinking we're right about nine of them are in, in the senior police officer band. All my other officers are, are um, stuck in the police officer band, and they're unable to move into that senior police officer band. Um, as far as um, how the, the salary survey uh, was the market study was conducted, um, my understanding is it, it was took the low of the um, police officer band and the high of the senior police officer band. Can I um, ask you to expand on what that might do to somebody who, hypothetically, let's say, they've been working 15, 16, maybe 17 years. I believe you can retire after 20, kind of like the Army. W wish I'd have done that, but I didn't. Um, how does that affect them? Well, if they're, if they're stuck in the police officer band, they're stuck at step 10 of the police officer band, and they'll never, it, 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 at the point unless we open up that band, they'll be stuck at the police officer band. So I've got quite a few that are, I've got actually nine, I think nine or 10 right now, that are stuck at step 10 of the police officer band. And their retirement would be calculated on how many months of service and their last, I mean, is that, in the Army, you know, there's very specific tables for this. Correct. I assume it's different here, so I, all I can refer to is, you know, how we did it in the Army, but you could tell me how that works for their uh, retirement. The public safety retirement system, they take your three highest years, and you get an average of those three highest, and then they, they take a percentage based off that average. 20, um, well, it depends on what band they're in. Tier, tier one is they get 50% of their, um, the average of their highest three at 20 years. Do you, I don't know the numbers, does somebody know the difference between a police officer at the top end of that band and a senior police officer in their band? How much difference is that? It's about, I want to say $7,000, six, $7,000, I believe. It's not a small difference. No. And taken over the course of three years and applied to retirement, it's something they're going to have to live with for the rest of their lives. Do you have a sense that we would have anybody in our police department who might think, better that I go to another police department in the state of Arizona that uses the same PSPRS system uh, so that I can amplify my final years of earnings so I can have a more comfortable retirement. Um, Mayor Sheehy, Council Member Grote. Yes. Um, so what you see here is the explanation of the uh, the creation of the senior police officer position that, that happened back in the, in the 90s and it was essentially what, what occurred back then was a mechanism, if you will, that allowed for police officers who were maxed out and who weren't receiving a, a annual step uh, step uh, increases or, or uh, raises every year, um, a, a new band was created to allow more growth to uh, to occur. Yeah. So that's um, tongue in cheek. That's one way to do it. In my mind, that's uh, putting a band aid on on something as opposed to taking a look at what the actual issue is. There's issues like that uh, that we're talking about now with the, the police officer and the senior police officer position and the Band-Aid approach, um, where that's why we're asking for dollars from council to allow us to do the positional analysis study to look at this issue and 150 more issues that are throughout the uh, the city, uh, all city departments, so uh, we can uh, create a uh, compensation structure that allows us, uh, that's, that's fair and equitable, allows us to compete with uh, other police uh, police departments and police agencies, um, public works, citywide. So we want to, again, we want to retain and attract the best and brightest employees. Uh, we need to fix our compensation structure in order to do that. This is one example of uh, a need, um, or more justification, I should say, to uh, to do the study and implement the study. Uh, Mr. City Manager, I think that's a great answer, and I really appreciate that. Um, and I agree with you. Uh, the only thing that, you know, the only detail that leaves me to wonder how this is all going to 
sort of shake out at the end of the day. And, and I'm really kind of worried about people who get towards their retirement. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to have no retirement. But the people who work here deserve to have a retirement. And if you've worked your whole life and longevity was a part of it in your organization, you got to have that retirement. I think that's particularly true for public safety people who could, on any given day, lose their life in that role. Um, I'm just drawing an observation. But the, the, the part that I'm curious about is that senior band being frozen and nobody can go there, that differential money is not available actually to the people who are working in our department. And yet, are we including that in our salary survey? And why would we do that? Because that artificially uh, creates a disadvantage for the police officers who are stuck in that band. Let's put it that way, because they're saying, okay, th this, this creates a salary up here, but you can't get there. That's like health care with a $10,000 deductible. It wouldn't matter if it's a $10,000 deductible or a $10 million deductible. It's equally inaccessible if you don't have the ten grand. Well, flip that around and say, in looking at the salaries, we're going to say that this is where you could get, but you can't get there. But we're going to include this in the analysis. So that artificially lowers what they're going to get in their pay. Is there a reason we chose to use that band? Are we going to unfreeze the senior band? Or do we want to move away from that because we view it's a, a Band-Aid approach? And if we are going to move away because we feel that's part of the Band-Aid approach, are we going to withdraw that from the analysis and have the analysis reflect the top of the police officer band? Does, does that make sense? Does everybody understand the question at hand? Quick question. Yeah. Isn't that what the survey is going to do? It's going to look at every department and it's going to look, well, this doesn't make sense to have this band and it's going to recommend changes after that. So we're kind of talking about what we're currently dealing with, but the study is going to dig into that. So it's kind of, until we have that information, um, it, my assuming it's going to resolve that issue yeah, with that the study. Is That's is that, the whole intent of the right? analysis. Okay. Yeah, yeah, comes to Lynn, do you have a comment as well? What would it hurt if we unfroze it right now? If we, I, I mean, uh, uh, the what, senior police. What? Yeah. So, um, what if we did it before the study? The, so, uh, yeah, I guess uh, you know it's uh, something that uh, we've discussed. But uh, um, again, there's hundreds of these different scenarios that exist within the city it itself. So, to isolate one specific instance and not address it uh, citywide um, is is something that uh, um, um, I. I'm not recommending. I think we need to look at this from a citywide perspective. We have uh, instances where we have uh, issues with recruitment or retention um, for multiple city departments. Um, that so we're talking about uh, public works, we're talking about police, we're talking about fire, we're talking about uh, uh, engineers and, and, uh, and other positions that we've had some difficulty attracting uh, in, in the past, and we need to uh, you know address it uh, in this way. So that's that's my recommendation. That's my suggestion. The uh, um, to kind of go back and talk about that uh, that band-aid approach so we, we have so we have a compensation uh, structure uh, a plan right now that is l riddled with band-aids and we we need to uh, set it aside and, and create something new that's going to be fair and equitable at the end of the day i need the ability to look at the employees in the eye and say that uh, that, that we're being paid, we're all being paid at uh, at market rate and that's something that's going to be vitally important the uh so I guess, I mean, I don't know if that helps or not, but if we're trying to, in the end, we're trying to do something that's going to be uh, um, collective and, and address all the issues across uh, across all city departments. Yeah, and if I may uh, uh, just add that, um, I'll just remind us of the conversation we had at our planning session in January, that the council had consensus that uh, we were going to address this in the positional analysis. We've stayed true to everything that we said uh, with getting the RFP out so positional analysis can start. Uh, once this council adopts uh, um, whatever budget uh, it comes before us next month. Um, so we're staying true to what we said um, to all of the staff uh, throughout the entire process and, and, and going forward. And, and it also what we said as a council when we all met to, together. So does that answer your question, Mr. Grote? Yeah, actually, Mr. Mayor, that, that, it beautifully answers my question. Um, and, and I agree with what the city manager and the mayor are saying, obviously, there. Sometimes information floats into the budget process after these key moments, and it might change how you think. Um, but at the same time, this is like <laughs> we're at the end of the game here, so th this is not the time, I don't think, to really start changing anything hugely. But I really appreciate all your answers, Chief. I just wanted to kind of bring that to everybody's attention and put that out there, because that's going to be something that we'll, we'll have to talk about going forward. 
Then uh, the next question, this one's not for you, Chief. I'm sorry. Well, it might be. I don't know how, how much you hang with the fire department, but. <laughs> oh, I can answer for them. Okay. <laughs> uh, Mayor and Councilperson Grote, I, I do want to add, because I, I think it is important, is we've been having this discussion year after year about doing something with the senior police officer band because I don't, I don't like the situation we're in. It's just year after year we've been not just holding the same budget, but the last two budgets we've been cutting and we've not been able to purchase patrol cars. We've had uh, our budget cut for contracts. So when you see these things like the $200,000 for the jail contract and the, and the fuel, that's because to get past expenditure limitation, all those things were being cut. So we've had the discussions with HR and the city manager about that banding to do something about it. Unfortunately, in the past few, you know, number of years, when you're cutting your budget, it's kind of hard to come up with money to, to make that because it, it will take it will take additional funds to be able to do that. And that was the goal with the positional analysis is that's one of the things we've had discussions about fixing fixing that band in the positional analysis. Thank you, Chief. I appreciate that you elaborated on that. And um, I just want to make this point to supplement what you have said and sort of shape a comment here, which is now, I like hockey, so I like to use the expression penalty box. Three minutes for high sticking, you sit in the penalty box. When you do salaries in a municipality, it's a two-year penalty box. Oh, we're going to change this. And you won't see that in your check for two years. Two-year penalty box, boom. So this is very important that we get it right as we go through the survey and get it into the next year. Because we can't come back with a half-baked answer next year boom, another two-year penalty box. That'll drive people from our department to other departments, people we've invested a lot of money to train. Now I wanted to take the opportunity to shift the next question. This one's Mr. probably Girl, a lot before, easier. Before you do, uh, Council Member McCoy has a oh, question. Sure. Yes, if I may, thank yes. you. Um, one of the questions I wanted to ask is, you know, I flipped back here to the very last page in our budget book, and it talks about the grant funds that um, come in for different departments. And I just wanted to um, ask a question about this, because when you look through these, I mean, there are some great grants that are being sought after. And I look through, look to the back, and the police department has had a great grant writer, <laughs> because there's been a lot of different grants. Now, I know there's somebody that researches what's out there. Is that a city staff individual, or is it someone in the police department? Are, are there other departments that can be out there looking for more grants to cover? This is just kind of a general question, kind of get back on our budget here, if I, if I may. Yeah, Mayor, uh, Council Member uh, McCoy, um, great question. Um, right now, we, uh, we love grants, so, but we like the right kind of grants. So those that don't come with uh, strings attached and, and uh, um, restrict our ability to uh, provide services or come with uh, hidden costs. So we like to identify the, uh, the good grants, and uh, police has done a wonderful job of identifying a lot of grants that uh, allows us to pay staff and purchase equipment. Um, right now, the, uh, the whole grant process is a little, is a little uh, de it's decentralized throughout the organization, so a lot of the work you see for the police grants are, are done um, uh, by, by members of the, the police department. Um, other departments uh, handle their grants to a certain extent. Um, we are going to bring uh, that a little, a little uh, we're going to transition to a little bit more of a centralized process. It still allows police to research and, and, and uh, um, acquire grants, but we're going to um, um, ask um, Holly Marin, our grants administrator, to help us out with uh, much more research and trying to identify additional opportunities as, uh, as we go. So, yeah, we, uh, we love the right kind of grants. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Grote, did you want to transition to fire? I sure. Understand? Well, yeah, I, 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 want, I want to say what a great question Councilmember McCoy just asked because a lot of important funding does come in from grants. <laughs> for example, I think I was looking at that like Department of Homeland Security funding for bomb suit and SWAT team equipment. Like, you know, we need that money for our people. Um, so I appreciate that. So like now I'm going to transition to the fire chief. <laughs> nice to see you, fire chief. Morning. Like, this is a pretty easy question for you, I'm sure, but it mystified me, and I asked a couple other people, and they gave me the answer, but I just wanted to confirm it, you know. 
we're, we're getting new, I think it was like, what, 33,000 bucks or something for new call-out gear or something like that. And I went, call-out gear? Is that like a whole separate uniform? Like, I had to get my bunker gear on and don't laugh. 60 seconds or less. You guys probably do it in 45 seconds. And I'm going, what in the world is call-out gear? That's bunker gear. It's bunker gear. Yes, we just have a new term. No, sir. We call it bunker gear. Okay. <laughs> Finance can call it whatever they want as long as they pay for it. <laughs> I didn't know. I was looking at the guy. I was like, what in the world is turnout gear, you know? I was trying to figure that one out. That was a headbanger. That was my question, Chief. I mean, I know that's easy. But um, the next question, uh, the fire hose, uh, how many years are we getting out of those, by the way? Just out of curiosity. I know that the heat deteriorates this equipment yes, faster. Uh, there's an old expression, heat reveals all weaknesses. So we, we all get that by July and August. It's probably even truer for the fire department. Can you kind of expand on that so we get an idea? Yes, sir. Obviously, we have a dry climate, as we know, and so uh, things do dry out quicker here, and um, things like hose can deteriorate quicker. Obviously, they're out in the direct sunlight when we're out of the station as well. So uh, the standard is 10 years. We try to always replace it within 10 years. Uh, we do a, uh, a very, very um, specific testing process annually on all the, all the hose. Um, that uh, as it gets towards the 10 years, it actually does tend to fail more often than, than uh, the newer stuff, obviously, as you would expect. Um, do we occasionally go over 10 years? And in recent years, yes, because we uh, simply pushed off some of the replacement schedules. We do, uh, we do generally try to stay on a replacement schedule to where that's always coming in, kind of a, a, a consistent uh, chunk, if you will, so that we're not doing large amounts. We did have a uh, major failure of a, a con an entire hose bed of supply line this last testing cycle. Um, actually, that is uh, going out for purchase, uh, I think, this week, as a matter of fact. We're doing what we can to stay on top of that as best we can, but also to get back on track with what we kind of got behind the last couple of years. And how's our skating gear? Our what? Self-contained breathing The SCBA? Yeah. Uh, well... You'll notice in in, refer, in reference to grants, you'll notice that we are going to FEMA for a grant for that. That's nearly a million dollar purchase, and that is that is coming up. I know we uh, we obviously look at stations, we look at uh, apparatus, we look at personnel, but sometimes there's a lot of other things that kind of go into that picture. Sure. One of which being the SCBA. Um, that that is uh, also tested uh, and inspected regularly. Uh, that has an annual process that goes like through. every week, maybe. <laughs> well, there is an annual actual test. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so, uh, are we reaching the point where we we need to figure out how we're going to replace that? Yes, we are. Uh, we're going out to grants now. Uh, did we think we would get it last year? No, but but really going taking taking another bite at the apple sometimes helps you the following year. So, are we going to resubmit that this year, hoping that maybe we're in a little bit better standing? We are. Um, are we eventually going to get to the point where if the grants don't come through, we have to come up with another solution? Absolutely. That's, oh. that's what we do. Thanks. And for the benefit of the people who might not be too familiar with some of those terms, self-contained breathing apparatus, that's the mask that the guys put on before they go into a burning building uh, so that they can live through the experience. Um, it's absolutely necessary gear, and it has to work 100% on time, all the time. There cannot be a failure of that equipment, or you've got a firefighter down. And uh, so that, that the reason I'm bringing that up is because, you know, as we think about budgets, it's important. You know, I mean, I haven't had my second cup of coffee, but my mental gymnastics tell me it takes about $3.4 million more to run our police department than it takes to run our fire department. But at the end of the day, those expenses – can flip very quickly when we have to replace big pieces of equipment. For example, a fire truck. Uh, how are we doing in that department, Chief? We, uh, as you know, we like to say we have five new apparatus. We have five apparatus that were purchased half of their life ago. So are, are we always looking at when we need to come back for more? Yes, we are. The, the reality is, is we probably should have looked at at least one apparatus a couple years ago and 409 kind of pushed that off. That is, is what it is. Um, uh, the, the engine at Station 6 is not one of the newer ones, and so that being over 10 years old would be the next one up. Um, do we expect to come back with some apparatus in the, in the coming years? Yes, because we, um, we do have those five that are now five years old, um, but we are over 10 years on that sixth one. Uh, the, we have a replacement, if you will, for all of those, a reserve apparatus. We don't have six. We actually have 12. Um, and uh, we actually use those regularly because just like every other car, every car you own, 
uh, engines go in the shop. So sure. uh, such as the five new ones, all of the five new apparatus have complete new uh, cooling systems because they simply did not withstand our heat um, at about $5,000 a pop. So uh, when those goes down, in come the reserve apparatus, and those obviously are considerably older. Uh, those were the old first line apparatus, um, and, and at some point will also have to be replaced. And so, uh, yes, you're, you're absolutely correct. There are a lot of big ticket items, and, and um, these budgets are very challenging. And so in defense of the police department, they cost more because they have dispatch in the jail. I'll give them that. But Yeah, you know, and they got a really nice area with a bunch of computers in it, and it's really cool. Uh, I get that. Thank you, Chief. I really appreciate that. But one more question mm -hmm. before you get away. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about training, but in particular, I mean, because we've got more training funds this year, which is a good thing, right? It's very – got to be careful how I use my words here. It's very – I'm going to go ahead and just say dangerous not to train on a lot of different things, but I'll just highlight one because it has such a direct impact to the community, which is hazmat. So you, you don't get a list from the shipping companies or the trucking companies or even the rail companies of what's coming through. Um, you know, imagine for a moment if you were in Kingman and you had a rail car with 20 train cars of ammonia and there was a derailment and explosion, what would that do? It would be enormously problematic we don't have that, but we're surrounded by it. And trucks come through our community with with hazardous materials. We we know that. We don't know. We don't get notifications as to what they are. So that's the problem. We don't get a notification as to what's coming down the road and what's going to be going through our community. Nobody does. There's reasons for that. Not the least of which is it would be a roadmap for people who are up to nefarious things. Mr. Grove, please get to the question. Yeah, I'm okay. just about to. You like okay, that was correct. a setup. I'm done with the setup, All Mr. Right. Mayor. Like here comes the question. Please. Right. So the question is, um, what is the status of our hazmat materials training? What is the status? We used to have a, a, an apparatus. I like that term. It was a truck. And all our hazmat gear would be in there. We have different things people in the fire department do. For example, they'll go out and they'll do rescues out in the desert with hikers. That happens pretty much every year. That's a series of training. You've got to know how to use ropes and be able to repel and all that stuff. I was using the hazmat, but feel free to fill it in with any of the other specialty training that you need to perform your services to rescue citizens and protect the safety of our citizens. That training is, do we have enough? Is there a shortfall anywhere in your professional opinion? Please take the stage, sir. I, I think we clearly established last year that there was a, was a shortfall. And so are we taking a a bite at that this year, yes, we are. We have about $120,000 additional in supplies and services, so the beans and bullets, if you will, in our in our budget. A large chunk of that, about 40,000, at this point, is allocated for training. Um, but as we know, as we go through the year, we have to make adjustments because we don't know what the year is going to entail. I'm in fact going to be here at the next council meeting for a cardiac monitor, which um, we kind of deferred from previous years, and we're not going to do next year. We have to kind of pull a rabbit out of a hat this year to figure out how to do that, and so that's what we're doing. And we do that every year. So with the 120000 this year that are going into all of those, those specific items, for about 40000 as I said, is specifically for training. Now, that, that's all training. Um, the command staff and I will get together after we have established what the budget will be to determine how we're going to operate next year. I can tell you in terms of hazmat, we have a meeting scheduled with the Kingman Fire just uh, next week or the week after. Um, for us to really talk about the long-term uh, future, and, and really where we see hazmat going in the county, because quite frankly, it's really just Kingman and us at the moment. Uh, because of rail and interstate, they're naturally going to keep that. Um, but as we prioritize and make tough decisions, we have, to, we have to do exactly that. We have to prioritize and make tough decisions. I'm not sure where uh, the history of our hazmat team is, or what the history is going to be. Do we still have a trailer? Do we have uh, personnel that have been trained? We do. But over the course of the last 10 years, as we have declined, if you will, in services and supplies, everything has declined. And citywide, this is not just a fire department issue, citywide things have declined over the last 10 years, and we have to make tough decisions, and that's what we're doing. Where we're at now is we have to determine what really we invest in to make sure we're, we're answering the calls we know that we're going to have. I have to question whether we invest in hazmat, given the fact that we don't have rail and interstate. Would I tell you that it's, it's reasonable to have a team? Absolutely. 
but the simple truth is, and I think we discussed it here today, that there is only so much resources available, and so where are we going to place those resources? So to answer that question, we're going to get together in the next couple weeks after we establish what the budget will be. We'll have this conversation with Kingman Fire. Um, I have actually urged the county to be a little bit more involved uh, in, in terms of hazmat, uh, but there are some things in, in very remote Arizona that we just can't do that we would probably do in much more populated areas. Um, Fire Chief, I want to commend you for exploring the opportunities to try and work with Mojave County to expand their role. Um, it should be obvious, it's fallen off a log, that Mojave County government has a huge role to play in hazmat preparation because of the Class 1 rail in the uh, interstate right there. Going through their population areas, our population areas, we'll say, so I really take my hat off to you for that. Um, uh, Mr. Goat, uh, Council Member Lynn, you have a, a question for the Chief? I, I have a quick, uh, quick question, and this could be for Chief Doyle or um, Chief Davids. Um, a couple months ago, I was at a school public safety meeting, and you both were attended at that, and there were some questions asked about on-site training um, with the two departments, mm -hmm. and so I'm, I'm looking, there's, you do have quite a bit of training between both departments this year in the budget. Is that something you guys are actively talking about? Because I believe at that meeting they said it was going to be done within the year. We do have some scheduled. We obviously don't advertise that for the purposes of not advertising it. Um, I, I think probably I, I explained this to the mayor at a, at a conversation about this a few months ago. And the, the reality is, is, is there's a place where we need to get, but we can't jump to it. And so uh, the school being a little bit better prepared and the district being a little bit better better prepared as well as us, um, we can we kind of need to accomplish all of them before we can really put them all together. So um, what what we could have if we kind of jump into it is uh, staff at one school kind of wanting to do something different than staff at another school. And our, our, our uh, preference and, and what we express to the school district is that we identify what the school district priority is going to be and really the, the appropriate response so that we're doing that universally school to school. That way our folks know exactly what to, what to expect no matter what school they show up at. A at that point then we can mesh ours into it, uh, but do we have an on-site drill with, with us and them uh, scheduled uh, this year? Yes, we do. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right, uh, do any other members at the council have any questions uh, for um, uh, any department? So I'm actually just going to go right down the, down the, the, the dais and, and give you one last opportunity, then we'll open up the call to the public. Chief, uh, thank, thank you. you. Yes. Uh, so Councilmember McCoy, do you have any questions at, at all regarding what was presented today or direction for city staff? Thank you. Um, I just um, want to say that I think the staff has done a great job and all the department heads to bring this forward. Um, er, all the information is here. Obviously, we have a lot of work to do with it. And uh, I appreciate everything you've done, but I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember McCoy. Councilmember Koch. I, I too want to thank the staff for a great budget. Um, once again, it's easy to read and easy to understand, and we appreciate you all being here to answer any questions. But at this time, I don't have any further questions. Thank you, Councilmember Koch. Vice Mayor Lane. No, I made my comments earlier. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Lynn. Yes, I have one last question. Um, can I ask a question to Mike in the Parks Rec um, Department? First of all, I really appreciate that teen break was brought back. And I guess my quick question is, do you think that you have uh, sufficient enough funds um, for next year? Are you happy with what the program was? Yes, we, we were really thrilled with the way uh, the program uh, processed this year. Uh, and we believe that we can even make it better and stronger. Uh, there are some funding, uh, approximately $23,000 in next year's budget. And I feel very confident uh, with the help of the community that we can really pull off a successful event again next year. Thank you. Any other questions, Councilmember Lynn? All right, uh, Councilmember Dolan. Just want to thank the staff um, for putting the budget together. This is my first budget process, so um, very well put together. I appreciate it. And thank you, Jill, for your team and Jess for everything you guys do. Thank you. And Councilmember Grote, do you have any final uh, questions? Thank you for asking, Mr. Mayor. I don't really have any questions. I'll. Uh, Amplify everybody's thanks and appreciation. You know, the budget is a, a very difficult process, which actually never ends. It really doesn't. But I will make this one little point. This budget and some of the things that we've heard about as we go into the next year or two, um, 
we should be cognizant of the fact that we have a lot of pressures coming on our expenditures. So that'll be both with the personnel side and with some key infrastructure and equipment that is required probably all across the city and not just limited to, to public safety. It's probably all across the city. We further know that when the ir irrigation and drainage district uh, proceeds are no longer available to us, which will happen in 2023, um, I like to say that's general funds money. I think of it as free cash flow, but it's ballpark. What is that going to be? More or less 5.3? 5.7 million dollars is going to vanish a year. So we're going to have a lot of increases and we're going to see some of the revenue decrease. Now our sales tax, depending on how the economy does, will increase a little bit, but that's not going to be enough to offset this. So we, we have some sharpening of the pencil to do to figure out how we're going to move forward. And the only way I can see that we're going to be able to move forward is we have to explore options to amplify the revenue side of the, uh, I want to say P&L, but we have a different expression in government. What is the expression for P&L? Profit and loss sheet. Yeah, okay. I used to say retain I I I I M. Income over expenses. All right, well, whatever. It's not balancing the budget if we don't pay attention to it. So enormous hard work. I think it's easier for people to see that those issues are going to be coming to greet us within the next two to three years because of the way the budget has been presented. This is a transparent budget, and that's not a surprise that we have won awards for it. So my hat's off to you. I hope we've been able to... Uh, um, express our appreciation, not just to you guys, but to our city manager and to everybody who makes this all happen. So thank you very much. All right, this is a public hearing. Would anyone like to address the city council on this matter? So you can just make your way to the podium and state your name for the benefit of the city clerk. Uh, Michael Fuller. Uh, good morning, Mayor and City Council. I am Michael Fuller, President of the Lake Havasu Police Officers Association. Over the last few months, our association has expressed our concerns through a multiple-page comprehensive market study, which was presented to City Council and staff in January of this year. And we also sent out a letter a couple weeks ago in response to a recent market study conducted by our city staff. That being said, this morning, I don't necessarily want to rehash or uh, go over the details of our concerns, which are uh, Lake Havasu police officers currently being paid anywhere from 15 to 18 percent below market average, nor the concern over the high amount of current vacancies in the police department, which as of this week is 10, the lack of any special duty or retention incentives that would be in line with industry standard, the suspended for now over 10 years position of senior police officer, or really the overall inability of the Lake Havasu City Police Department to currently attract hire and retain police officers. There are a lot of officers that are currently frustrated and have lost their patience and they would love for me to come in here with a pitchfork, which if you know me really isn't my style. So instead this morning I want to tell two stories that I hope paints a picture of our overall frustration. The first is a story of two Lake Havasu City police officers who I will refer to as Officer A and Officer B. On November 21st, 2005, Officer A was hired by the Lake Havasu City Police Department as a lateral officer. Officer B was hired by the Lake Havasu City Police Department a short 46 days later on January 4th, 2006 as a cadet officer, and he entered the academy effectively separating Officer A and Officer B for about, uh, of about six months. Fast forward three years later to around 2009, Officer A become el became eligible for the position of senior police officer. He takes his test and earns the raise and enters the senior police officer pay band just like every other officer did before him. Officer B, not too long after, also becomes eligible for the position of senior police officer. He goes to take his test and is told that the position is being suspended by the city manager at the time due to the economic downturn. Officer B is told that he would have to remain a police officer with no opportunity to enter the senior police officer pay ban as he expected at that current time because of the suspension. Because of the positional suspension, year after year, Officer B, who is doing the same work as Officer A, continues year after year to make on average $5,700 per year less than Officer A. 
Because of the suspension of the SPO position, the issues within the department begins to compound itself over time as officers C, D, E, F, G, and so on, who are hired after Officer B are also unable to become senior police officers when eligible. They are also doing the same job, yet making on average $5,700 per year less than Officer A. Fast forward 10 years later, which brings us to today, both Officer A and Officer B still work for the Lake Havasu City Police Department as well as officers C, D, E, F, and so on. Today, for unknown reasons, the senior police officer pay ban is still suspended. Officer B and every officer hired after him have never become eligible to be enter the senior police officer pay ban. Officer B, is, who is still doing the same job as Officer A today, is making $6,407 per year less than Officer A which equates to Officer B over the last 10 years grossing close to $60,000 less than Officer A has. Officers C, D, E, F, G, and so on are also currently in the same situation Officer B finds himself in. As an association, over the last several months, we try not only to express these concerns, but try to encourage movement in the right direction to put all officers in the same pay band so that every officer was on the same level playing field going into next year and potentially moving into whatever direction comes from the positional analysis being proposed. Story number two comes from my own personal experience. Almost 19 years ago in August of 2000, I began my law enforcement career working for a smaller police department in Arizona. In 2003, with about three years of experience, I made the decision to leave the city police department I started out in and I began looking for a department to lateral over to. I searched various city police departments that were hiring across Arizona and I came across Lake Havasu City, which was a city that surprisingly I had never been to even though I was raised in Arizona. I decided to come out for a visit. I enjoyed it, saw potential, and out of all the police departments I could have gone to, I put in one application and chose to test for an officer position with the Lake Havasu City Police Department in May of 2003. I arrived to testing knowing that at the time Lake Havasu City PD had, had two vacancies. When I arrived, I noticed about 40 candidates testing for these two positions, which today is unheard of and is nowhere near close to the applicant pool that we currently have. Long story short, I made it through the lengthy hiring process and was hired to fill the last of the two open positions, becoming officer number 77 of the 77 allotted positions the agency had at that time. Officer number 76, who was hired at the same time to fill the other vacancy, was also a lateral police officer from another agency and he also still currently works for the Lake Havasu City Police Department. Both our hires brought the, depa the, the department to full staff, 77 sworn. We were both lateral officers so that did not have, so the city did not have to pay for us to go to the academy, also saving the city in the long run. That was in 2003 and what prompted me to come to Lake Havasu City was a higher starting salary that was comparable at the time to some of the Phoenix area police departments, pay incentives for certain uh, certifications and extra duty assignments being offered, lower health care costs compared to what I was paying at the time, tuition reimbursement, and a still relatively reasonable housing market where I could afford to move my wife and three kids to. That picture, unfortunately, is very different today. From 2003 to 2007, 2008, I continued to see the Lake Havasu City Police Department grow and progress and grow at a rate comparable to the city's growth to the level of having 96 sworn police officer positions budgeted for years 07-08. Fast forward to 2009, about 16 years after my uh, initial hire here and about 11 years from the department having 96 sworn positions, I see in the proposed 2019-2020 budget that we are allotted and budgeted 80 sworn police officer positions. As I mentioned 16 years ago, I was officer number 77 of 77. So in 16 years, we have essentially net gain three additional police officers, let alone current issue of having 10 vac vacancies, which puts us currently operating in a police department with 70 sworn officers. Now you might ask, can the Lake Havasu City Police Department police the entire city with 80 officers or even the 70 that we currently have? And the short answer is yes, we have no choice. Fortunately, we have great officers who are always going to push forward and do what is needed, but I would have to sum it up like this. I heard the Administrative Service Director during the Council Retreat in January make a statement in relation to the overall number of employees as a city that we currently have compared to the past numbers, and the statement was that, the city, that as a city we are doing more with less. Now in my opinion, eight, nine, ten years ago when we started losing all the positions, 
I think we could have been, that could have been said, but at some point when, the, when that continues, it changes from doing more with less to just doing less with less. If we are not careful, a police department can easily become primarily reactive rather than being as proactive as they should be. That Mr. all being Mr. Fuller, I'm sorry, you, you're past your five minutes. If oh, you could sorry. just kind of wrap up your comments. Yeah, I'm wrapping up. All right, thank sorry you. About that. that all being said, today I stand here and believe the Lake Havasu City Police Department can still be the department that others want to work for. There are great pieces in place. As an association, we are keenly aware of the hurdles before us, and as we have tried to portray, we have no doubt that these issues are directly related to our substandard employee compensation, and we are concerned about what another year of doing nothing means. However, we are committed to helping out wherever needed to tackle these clear issues before us, before the department, and before the city, and we look forward to your commitment also. I want to thank the council and staff for all that you do, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Would anyone else like to address the city council on this matter? And just make your way to the podium and state your name if anyone would like to. All right, we'll close the public hearing. All right, uh, from the council, um, any, any final pieces of direction you want to give staff? I think uh, we went through that opportunity. Uh, so we'll move on to um, item six, which is our final call to the public. Would anyone like to address the city council on any matter um, in the jurisdiction of the city? Seeing them, we'll, we'll close the call to the public. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. I have a motion by Vice Mayor Lane and a second by Councilmember Dolan. We are adjourned. Thank you.